Hello everyone, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing fine. And um, I'm doing fine also, by the way. And I'm going to cover a couple things here uh, before I begin. And one is uh, I want to remind everyone that we have our seventh rational physics conference in Bora, Sweden. Keep reminding you so that you make your uh, reservations, whatever, in advance if you plan to go. And here's the, uh, the picture that synthesizes it. Okay, it's going to be in Sweden. It's going to be on the 8th of um, June. And um, some pretty interesting people are going to show up. So um, I recommend anyone who has questions, who wants to learn something, wants to discuss his theories, this is the place to be. Okay, 8th of June, be there or be square. Um, if you need to, uh, by the way, it's free. Uh, and the other thing is, if you want to notify me, you can do so through the uh, Patreon site, or you can find it also in on Facebook. Okay, uh, I think some people had problems finding it, but all you, as far as I know, all you got to do is put 7th Rational Physics Conference and you're there. And um, I don't know if, if people are having problems finding it or what. Anyways, um, 7th Rational Physics Conference, 8th of June in Sweden, Bora, Sweden. Uh, next thing I want to mention is that I'm going to be next week, uh, not next week, this Sunday, this coming Sunday, I'm going to be on JFG's program again. And that's JFG there. You can find him as JF. Garipi, Garipi, Garipi. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his uh, last name. I'm going to have to ask him about it. Anyways, I'm going to be there uh, this Sunday, 1900 hours Quebec time, Eastern Standard Time, New York time. And we're going to be discussing black holes and very likely dark matter as well. Uh, these are two related subjects, dark matter and black holes. Uh, they kind of go hand in hand. And uh, lately they've been on the news. They've been on the news really for the last, um, you could say, couple of years. Uh, they were on the news about two years ago when um, allegedly, right, they discovered two black holes or they assumed or they inferred or they they claim they proved <laughs> that two black holes collided and they generated gravity waves and the detectors here on earth detected the gravity waves and from those gravity waves which apparently were predicted by mathematical physics they inferred or they proved or whatever uh, that there are black holes, not only that there are black holes, but that two of them collided because there's no other way that you can generate those gravity waves. And, um, and then more recently, the other day, uh, they took a picture of um, a black hole. Now, how's that for proof <laughs> and evidence? Yeah, they took a picture of a black hole, or so they claim, right? Um, actually a reconstruction uh, they they really took many pictures and they fed them into a computer they had this algorithm and they came up with this image which they published throughout the world and I'm sure we're going to be discussing at least those two uh, plus you know the question I always have <laughs> which is what is a black hole maybe someone can someday tell me okay Anyways, we'll be discussing that this Sunday, if you care to um, tune in. Uh, that's going to be on JFG's program. You can find them relatively easy on the uh, YouTube channels. Okay, You can find them in there. Okay, so um, where were we? A uh, couple of, uh, about a month ago now, <laughs> at least I'd say. Um, well, we were trying to figure out the vacuum. That's the uh, subject of today. Uh, I'm going to 
go back there. Not that we're abandoning light because we have, we, we need light and light it has to do with the ether and ether has to do with the vacuum. So they're all kind of chasing their tail around. You can't do one without the other. So uh, whenever you talk really of light, uh, you must talk about the vacuum in one way or another. Specifically, if you are going to argue that um, light is the shaking of the ether, the vibration of the ether, the undulation, the waving of the ether. Um, other people argue that there is no ether and that light does not need a medium through which to propagate. Exactly what they mean by that, I'm not always sure because uh, that has can have two meanings. Are they saying that there is something called light and it goes, for example, through space, through empty space, and it can because it doesn't because space does not need to be a physical medium? Is that what they're saying? Or are they saying that light itself? is not mediated by a physical mechanism, but by a physical entity, an agent of some kind, a material agent. And, uh, you know, they, they have these two versions. You, you always have to figure out which one they're talking about. But anyways, we started a couple uh, weeks ago, three weeks, maybe four weeks now, um, with Mr. Larry Krauss. And he, I thought that was a very good introduction with Larry in there because, uh, he claimed that he wrote a book and he keeps advertising in several of his interviews and so on that he can create a universe from nothing. He wrote a book, uh, I think it was 2012 perhaps, and he says the following, he says uh, at the bottom, he says, I have focused on either the creation of something from pre-existing empty space or the creation of empty space from no space at all. And uh, one of the things uh, you want to focus on is the fact that he uses the term empty space. You know, uh, here we have um, space. You would think space is already empty. I mean, unless it's, it's some kind of ether, right? Uh, and we can get into that, but I mean, you would think that if it's not some kind of ether, then it is completely empty, and then yes, you would be talking about nothing, whatever nothing is, we would have to define that term. But at least uh, you're, you're saying, look, you can't say empty space, because that would be like empty, empty, or uh, empty nothing, or uh, no va or, uh, vacuum, or empty vacuum, or something along those lines. And so uh, empty, em empty space sounds like empty, empty. That's what it sounds like, okay? So I don't know about uh, Lawrence Krauss uh, saying empty space, why they have to clarify that. Uh, you would think space is already empty. Okay, so uh, what is uh, Krauss saying? Does he say that, um, that uh, space was created? Well, if, if space is something, <laughs> I guess you would, you can talk about the possibility of it being created, right? But um, if space is nothing, how do you create nothing? So it's important to keep that, that in mind in the background here because y you can't get away from that question. If, if space is something, you can talk about God or whatever creating it. It's like you're saying, I'm going to create a chair, right? Okay, so everybody understands that. There's nothing, and suddenly you create a chair. But if space is nothing, you can't say you turn nothing into nothing. <laughs> I mean, I do that all the time. I convert nothing into nothing every day. And so the question is, you know, um, automatically when you say that you created space, you are treating space as a physical object. So you can't use the word nothing in that, or empty, really, in that case, because you're saying then essentially that empty, that space is something. You're saying uh, space is like a chair, or like a table, or like a bed, or like a tree, or like a rock. You're saying that space is something. Okay, so uh, is that what uh, Larry Cross means? He's uh, creating space from nothing, meaning he's creating something from nothing. 
Well, not really. Uh, he goes a little deeper and he goes in there and he says, look, you know, we have um, empty space, which is actually made of particles in, the, in, the, in mathematical physics. They think of this as, as particles, right? And uh, how do they create it? Well, you can take positive energy and negative energy, put them together, and kaboom, you create space. Is space empty? Is that empty space? Well, not really, because uh, it's got an energy of zero. That's what they're saying, but it's made out of particles. They're saying there's some sizzling energy in there. There's uh, a lot of activity in that so-called empty space. And that makes you kind of wonder, you know, what was the purpose of getting the positive and negative energy together if you're going to end up with something anyways? At no point do you have nothing in, in this whole movie. There's, there's no such thing as nothing because even the energy uh, that is zero is simply an operation of, two neg of a negative plus a positive. That's what they're saying. Okay, so um, you can take uh, particles, turn them into space. You can also do the opposite. You can take uh, um, space and turn it into two particles, what they call virtual particles. Okay, so you um, take empty space supposedly right and since it's uh, zero energy right that's what empty space is supposedly and uh, what is zero energy well it's the uh, taking plus energy minus energy that's what zero energy is it's like taking plus 100 minus 100 you end up with zero and so if you take 100 apples minus 100 apples, you get zero apples. That's what they're saying. They're saying you still have the apples. It's just zero apples. And what you really have is 100 over here and, and a negative uh, 100 over there, some kind of accounting. And the question is, is this physics? You know, are, are, are these people talking physics or are they just talking math? Because in math, we can do anything we want. It's just abstract, okay? But to say that, to, to project that onto the real world and say, oh, we take zero energy. That's what space is. Well, zero energy sounds like nothing. Well, not really. See, because over here we have 100 energy and here we have a negative 100 energy. And when we put them together, you have zero energy. But when you separate them, we have plus 100 energy and negative 100 energy, which, by the way, turn into virtual particles. And that's how they morph a concept energy, which they've never defined, into so-called mass. Remember, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times velocity of uh, light squared. So they're turning energy, which is supposedly, in their minds, I guess, some kind of concept, some kind of spirit, and it turns into mass, which is a physical object. And that's how you get the uh, virtual particles, the positive and the negative virtual particles. Okay, so we started with that, but it turns out that uh, Larry Cross wasn't the guy who came up with all this, right? Um, it precedes him. Uh, if you go back in time, you find that Mr. Uh, Hawking, Stephen Hawking, he wrote it in his uh, famous bestseller, uh, Brief History of Time, and in Chapter 8 you will find this. You will find that uh, he says that the Big Bang itself, so he's talking about the origin of the universe, or at least very close to that point. Uh, he says the universe is thought to have had zero size. Okay, so we're talking about, uh, again, a singularity, I guess, what they call uh, in mathematics. Uh, what we're really talking about is zero size. We're talking about nothing. Now there you have nothing, a zero size something. That's a nothing. Okay, but he says there are uh, something like 10 million, blah, 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 uh, lots of uh, numbers, uh, n lots of zeros, particles in the region of the universe that we can observe. Where did they come from? The answer is that in quantum theory, particles can be created out of energy. So he's already beat uh, Krauss to the punch. He's already said, look, uh, I, already, I already figured this out, so you're just uh, um, plagiarizing me. You're, you're stealing my, my argument, okay? That's all that Krauss did in his book. And he just continues, to, but that just raises the question where the energy came from. The answer is that total energy of the universe is exactly zero. That's how they get the zero uh, nothingness of space. 
Okay, he just says the total energy is zero. Okay, great. So we have zero energy. We have nothing. Not really. He said the matter in the universe is made out of positive energy. Now, twice zero is also zero. Thus, the universe can double the amount of positive matter energy and also double the negative gravitational energy without violation of the conservation of energy. So again, it, it, this is a mathematical trick, as you can see. It's, uh, it's just a fancy footwork done by the mathematicians. They're saying, look, just take positive energy and negative energy, put them together, you get zero energy, and that's space, empty space. Is that space really empty? No, because see, when you separate them into positive and negative energy, then you have um, something, two somethings. And since energy is the same thing as mass, a, a different form of mass, that's how they turn into particles. So uh, essentially, Krauss said the same thing as Hawking. Turns out that Hawking was the, the guy who said it first, for the first time either. Uh, we go back to, what is it, 1934, and we have Mr. Uh, let's see if I can get him here. Oh, uh, where is he? We have Richard Tolson, and uh, he was a mathematical physicist. Uh, out of Caltech. There he is with Einstein in 1932. And in 1934, he writes this book in which he says he's the guy who really comes up with this idea, I think. I mean, that's as far as I got. Maybe if you go backward in time uh, to the uh, early uh, 20th century, you probably found, would find that someone else mentioned it. But I think this is a fair uh, uh, guess here that Tolman was the first guy who came up with that. And if that's the case, neither uh, Hawking nor Krauss get the uh, cigar, okay? Because someone already mentioned all this. Okay, so uh, we have these people. They're talking about zero energy turning into positive and negative energy. Uh, one's going to be the uh, mass. The other is going to be the gravitational energy, whatever energy is. We have Mr. Richard Feynman, Nobel Prize, 1965. He says, we have no idea what energy is. So, <laughs> That ends the circle. We, we have no idea what these people are talking about. They don't know what they're talking about, okay? Okay. It turns out that um, really the um, uh, this space thing in there, it's, it's a little more complicated. You have energy, and they turn into positive and negative particles. But what are these particles? Well, you have here uh, Mr. Sean Carroll, which probably didn't come up with this either. I, I don't think he did, okay? And he looks at something like this. He says, look, uh, what a particle really is, it's a vibration of a field. And there you have an idea of what he might be referring to. Here you have a, a particle. What is a particle? Well, it's really uh, like a concentrated field at that point. It's just all fields everywhere, but at this point, point, the one in the center, for example, not the little ones that are in the background there, but this one here, you can see that's, uh, it's just a field vibrating at a given point in space, and that's what they're going to call a particle, okay? What is a field? Well, that's another guess that nobody has figured out. Uh, a field supposedly extends all the way to the edge of space or space-time, uh, wherever that is, and so they just leave it indefinite, like, we're not going to answer that question. Uh, all they worry about is what happens locally, and that's the vibration of that uh, so-called field. And that's what a particle means to them today. Sean Carroll goes out of his way to make sure that you understood that that's the case. In other words, that a particle is really a vibrating field. So what are they uh, describing? And I'm saying in, in what they're really describing is the rope model, and here you'll see it, okay? You have all these little particles. Uh, we start here, uh, we have the electromagnetic rope. It bind, uh, light is just a torsion along the rope. And the rope binds any two atoms, okay, in the universe. So that's our basic system. But all these atoms are everywhere, okay? And uh, so they're, and they're all tied to each other and they're vibrating. So there you have your vibrating uh, field. That is the field. And they move around and they do all these fancy little things that confuse the mathematicians. And what they've done essentially is saying, look, every time we measure space, we find some kind of vibration, some energy in there that's moving and uh, particles suddenly come in from the void and then go back into the void. Well, what they're doing is detecting an atom there 
at some point and then you know they they simply guess that what they've done is create a particle that suddenly disappeared uh, from from their view or from their detection and that's all they're doing I think uh, you can just as well explain this with a rope model without any problem whatsoever okay okay uh, so what is the issue? The issue is that these people are dealing with ether. They're dealing with an ether. They might, uh, you know, uh, a lot of them will deny it because they don't like the word ether. Uh, supposedly, uh, Michelson and Morley uh, proved the non-existence of the ether in 1887. They carried out a series of experiments there. And... Uh, they show that there is no ether because light uh, goes in every direction at the same speed and doesn't bump or scrape against this so-called ether. Well, to most people, at least in the mathematical world, that proved to them that there is no ether. A lot of people out there still believe that there is an ether and that Michelson uh, either ran his experiment wrong or it was misinterpreted. There's all versions out there that you will read. Lots of people who are dissatisfied with the notion that there is no ether. But it turns out that the mathematical physicists also believe in the ether because, as you can see, they just call it something different. They'll call it energy or they'll say well these are virtual particles they pop in from the void and then go back in there and or they'll say it's a vibration of a field so they have all these versions of this junk that's out there that we can't see but it's there why because every time they go to the lab they do something and suddenly it appears like uh, something appeared from out of nowhere okay and they can't explain it so they say oh the the vacuum itself is made of something and what are they describing they're describing the ether okay so let's assume for the sake of argument that that's what they're referring to here we have uh, ether particles okay that's probably what they're referring to just to make it simple we have the red dots we'll call those the particles and the white background that encapsulates each one and gives shape to each particle okay so that's the ether that they have in mind. These are the particles that are vibrating in the background. Okay, so uh, what is the issue? The issue is what is the white stuff? Because if ether are the particles, what is the white stuff? It's a valid question. You know, and, um, and here you have, uh, for example, uh, clearly, uh, you know, you can see it better. You can see the each particle is surrounded by some white stuff that gives it shape or that doesn't allow it to extend indefinitely. So obviously there, is, there, there are two things inside your field of view. There's a white stuff and a red stuff. If we call the balls the ether balls or particles or whatever they want to call them, corpuscles, then what is the white stuff? Is that the space that is occupied by the ether balls? Or are we going to say that... Um, there is no such thing as space, it's only ether. Well, let's, let's remove space, okay? Or let's remove the balls, whichever way you want to see it. There you have it. That's what it would look like, exactly like that. Either that's space or those are ether balls without space contouring them. So you have a single block of whatever, call that, call that ether, call it X, it doesn't, space, it doesn't matter. You have a single block of something because there's no separation uh, between particles or, or component. There are no components. It, you're just talking about a single block. And here, uh, here you have it, uh, for example, uh, the same block, okay, because it takes us to the next question. Here you have uh, the block, and it's, uh, you can see it's made out of a single piece, um, except you know that it has an ending in other words it's not infinite and that is the question the question is is that block infinite or does it is it made out of particles and if it's made out of particles are the particles do the particles extend infinitely in other words here here you have it with particles okay same thing uh, except that the block is now made of particles and the question always is you know what is the white stuff that contours it, assuming that whole block has some shape, some, um, it's finite. And then you would also have to answer, you know, what is the black stuff? 
So uh, right now we have three things in front of our eyes. We have some red little dots. We have some white stuff that give contours each one of them, gives shape to each ball. And then we have the black stuff that gives shape to the whole block, assuming the block is not infinite. Okay? So people have to answer these questions. They have to uh, determine what the ether is before they begin their presentation. Otherwise, you know, they, they don't have anything to offer, anything to teach you. This has to be resolved before they come up with any theory concerning the ether. Okay. Um, so where did all this ether stuff come from? Well, as I showed the other day, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, uh, this all comes from the Greeks. We go back to the Greeks, and what do we find? Well, we find that they had several schools. Okay. We had with the Eleatics, we had the uh, Ionian school, probably the earliest one, uh, the Stoics. We had several of these. And you can really um, uh, synthesize these down to three or, or crunch them down to three. There were really three ideas kicked around by the um, Greeks, and they're still around in, in one way or another today. In other words, we haven't resolved the question. And here I uh, show you... Um, let me make that a little bigger. Uh, the three main currents. The first one was Democritus. He was from the uh, atomists or the, um, you can call them the uh, materialists. And what they said, look, you got particles and they move. And when they move, they leave space behind them. That's the first uh, uh, notion of the 15, uh, uh, 16 square puzzle, uh, puzzle right? Uh, the uh, Parmenides and his Eleatics, they said, no, there is no motion and there is no space. No such thing as space, no such thing as nothing, really, that's what he said. And he says there is no motion because as soon as uh, something wishes to move, uh, where would it move if, it's occupied, if that space is already occupied? And, uh, and anyways, you would leave a space behind, something would occupy that assuming there is motion. So he concluded the opposite. He says there can't be any motion. Motion is an illusion. That's what the Parmenides uh, said. Well, Aristotle took a little bit of both. He said, look, there is motion, but when a particle moves, something immediately takes its place. Okay? So there's no such thing as, as empty space, or the, uh, the way it's said today is nature abhors a vacuum. You know, nature doesn't like vacuum because immediately when there's a vacuum, something fills it. So there is no such thing as nothing again. And this takes us back to, to what we just said about, you know, the mathematical physicists. They look at all this and they say, oh, uh, we, we go with the Aristotelian version. In other words, they say, you yeah, something moves, something occupies its place, so there is no such thing as vacuum. And you would say, well, you know, uh, if, if a particle moves from here to from A to B, in the m the moment it, it moves from A to B, doesn't it that split second doesn't it leave some kind of space, some opening there for something else to fill it? And I guess the answer they would give you today is that, um, you know, that. Um, it, it's like a train. You know, one wagon moves, the other one moves right immediately behind it. So it's like for them, there's no such thing as space because space itself is just energy, which they haven't defined. Uh, it's a f vibrating fields, which they haven't defined. And all this stuff is there. It's moving. And you wonder if, if these are discrete little things, like, you know, if, if, if a particle is a vibrating field, for example, at, at localized, it's vibrating. How come it's vibrating? What is it moving into and coming back to? You would think that if it moves a little, it leaves a space behind. And they're saying, well, something else fills that space. So it's like the whole universe is moving up and down and sideways and vibrating in all directions. But when something vibrates up, some other thing vibrates up as well. And that goes all the way to the to infinity, I guess. <laughs> you see, this is their notion. This is what they what they have in their minds, and they don't try to resolve that because they say, "Well, that's semantics, that's ontology, that's philosophy, that or philosophy of physics, or philosophy of science, that's metaphysics." They use all these terms to dismiss it and say, "We don't deal with those things. 
We just deal with physics. See, it's the other way around. First, you got to point to your scenario. Then you can tell your theory. And they don't do it that way. They tell their theory and they say, oh, by the way, yeah, uh, we, we use this uh, notion of the ether, which is a pragmatic, uh, uh, an operational definition, a functional definition. So they work backwards. That's the issue. The issue is that that's not the way science works. Science should work forward. You should start with a hypothesis, point to the objects, and there from there build your theory. They don't do that. In fact, they never get to the original points. They, they say, oh, we don't deal with that. That's on the other side of campus. You want to find out? Go to the philosophers or whoever on the other side. We don't deal with those issues. We just deal with physics. Well, we look in the lab. We, we measure. We uh, describe with the equations. And these are our conclusions. This is a vibrating field. What is a field? Go ask Faraday. He's, you know, two meters under the ground now. Uh, that's, that's, that's today. Okay, that's, that's where we are today. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the uh, you know, the uh, Greeks also had that issue. Is the ether infinite or is it fi uh, finite? And, you know, does it, it, does it go beyond uh, the old Mount Olympus, you know, where the gods are, or does it stay on this side? Uh, for example, Aristotle believed, like, you see it there, uh, that, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, Aristotle believed that uh, the ether only was in Mount Olympus. It was out there between the moon, uh, behind the moon. After anything that came up uh, behind the moon, outside the moon, uh, that was the ether and that belonged only to the gods. It wasn't here on earth. But that idea never took uh, hold. Everybody believed otherwise that the ether did, you know, was here on earth and it was known as the fifth element. Okay? So that's the notion we inherited from these folks. The question is, uh, you know, we, we ended up the other day with Maxwell. And Maxwell came up with his four main equations. But the fifth one is the one he's most famous for, and that's of the speed of light. He took, uh, he calculated that the uh, uh, inverse square root of um, uh, the magnetic permeability and the electric permittivity, um, that equals the speed of light. Where did he get that? Well, when he did the calculation, he ended up with 300,000 kilometers per second. And so he says, you know, this, this number is so close to what Fizeau measured, you know, with the tooth wheel that I showed the other day. And um, so he says that, that value is so much, so close to that, that I know I hit it on the nose. He says, this is the equation of the speed of light, one over the square root of mu and epsilon. Okay, and that was the speed of light. And that's a, you know, you don't want to take that away from him. That, that was a significant uh, discovery. I think that's important. What is the problem? The problem is that throughout the 19th century, all the way to Maxwell, no one figured out what light is. What you had here is people who were mathematicians talking to people who were experimentalists. Uh, prime example, James Maxwell with Faraday. They talk to each other. They say, what did you find in the lab? Well, this is what I did. Did you understand anything? No, I didn't understand squat. Uh, okay. And so the other guy said, let me see. Let me take the values that we have out there, me measurements, the, the numbers that people are getting all over the place. He did some calculations. He said, oh, okay, I found it. Speed of light. Here it is. And it's the, uh, got to do with the permittivity and the permeability. So, so we have equations, we have mathematicians, and we have experimentalists, and no scientists. Scientist is a guy who explains. None of these guys explained. I, a lot of them just gave up and they said, well, I'm just going to describe, measure, and publish. And that's what we're doing to this day. We're still doing equations, we're still doing measurements. And we still have no explanations for simple things like gravity. We don't have a, an explanation for magnetism, for electricity, for how the atom works. We have, what we're missing are the explanations. And, and I'm talking about very simple things. A magnet attracting another, like I showed the other day, just two pieces of metal. Now, how complicated can that be? Okay. And we don't have an explanation for what the mechanism is. And all we need to do to figure that out is look at, you know, uh, you know, pro make proposals for the invisible agent. 
that is mediating, you know, between the two magnets. That, that's all we have to do. That's how simple it is. It really is simple. You might say, well, you, you know, it's a lot more complicated than that. No, it's not. It is not. And I explained the case uh, of, you know, a farmer pulling on a donkey. If you don't see the rope, it's magic. How is he doing that? He's, he's pulling, but he's, he's going like this. I don't see anything in his hands. And the donkey's coming closer and closer and closer to him. How does he do it? Is that magic? And the guy breaks his head. And he says, no, how is he doing that? Is he going to do equations? No. All he's got to do is figure out what the agent, what the mediator is. And of course, once you see the rope, zippers, kid stuff, kindergarten stuff. You know, he had a rope, he was just pulling on a rope. But it only was mysterious because you couldn't see the rope. And the magnet is no different. You have two magnets, one attracting the other, and they're pulling. Not like the ether folks say, you know, push gravity, push magnetism, no such thing. You can see, you know, there's, there's no force on my hands when, when two magnets are attracted. You can see that they're pulling on my hands. Nothing, the walls of the house are not pushing my hands closer together, okay, to, towards the magnet. When I pull, you can see that, you know, you can see that it's, it's pulling and not pushing, okay. But don't tell that to the ether folk or to people who talk about push gravity and push magnetism because these people are completely deranged. They're out of it completely. These people have no ability to think, period. And uh, same thing with the people who propose ether. These people are proposing here that there's some kind of uh, waving of, of some kind of uh, invisible stuff out there. Well, maybe there is some waving, yeah. No doubt about that. But the question is, are these particles? And here you have uh, Maxwell. Again, I'm going to put uh, his equation up there. And... Uh, we don't care really about his equation because, yeah, that's that's a good feat that he did out there. But let's look at what he thought had in mind. He had in mind these vectors and those, uh, you know, blue and yellow arrows, they're vectors. They have magnitude and direction. This is a concept. This is not a physical object. You cannot say that um, light is a waving of vectors. Likewise, you cannot say that light is, and here I showed it the other day, a uh, waving of numbers. Is, is that what light is? Is that the medium mediator of, um, of light? A bunch of numbers that are moving? How about of energy? Can we say that? And again, you can see that we're having problems by saying, you know, that light is a waving of numbers, a waving of energy, a waving of vectors. None of these correspond to a physical object, okay? So none of this uh, has any validity in physics, okay? Okay, so what did, um, what did uh, Maxwell have in mind? Well, maybe he had in mind something along these lines. Uh, maybe he was thinking along uh, Huygens' lines. Maybe he's saying, well, the ether is just a bunch of uh, waves. Maybe this is what he visualized. Maybe this is what cross his mind that maybe this maybe light is some kind of thing like this or was he thinking more along this these lines did he think that maybe they were a bunch of balls that are uh, waving are, are is this is this what he had in mind just waves of balls is that what the ether is is that what light is is this is how is this how light is transmitted is this how light propagates so these are the things that we have to look at. We have to look at what is light, and it does it. Is there a medium that me, Is there an agent that mediates light? Okay. Okay. So um, we have to look at a little bit of the uh, history of vacuum. Turns out that you know nobody did much work on the on the vacuum because lots of people did not believe that there could be a vacuum. Uh, they just took for granted maybe what Aristotle said. Oh, Aristotle told us that, you know, like Einstein t tells us today. Well, Aristotle told us that, you know, there is no such thing as a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum, right? And just in case, uh, if he was in sufficient uh, uh, authority, then you had Parmenides. He also said there's no vacuum. 
who was going to listen to poor old Democritus, right? He's the, the only guy who would say, oh, there is a vacuum. Okay. And, you know, we have no works essentially from Democritus. Everything we know about Democritus can, comes from someone else. Okay, so um, what happened? Well, uh, for uh, uh, even even in, from the times of the Romans, you know, they they did uh, use some kind of vacuum, but they were not aware of of really the theoretical part. They they just use it from a pragmatic point of view. You know, the uh, the uh, Romans were pretty good engineers, and they were able to suck water from here and. Uh, uh, you know, put it on like under aqueducts and so on. So they had some engineering uh, things there that allowed them to pump water at least, right? Uh, and they were using vacuum technology without really knowing it. They were vacuuming, you know, like the water s somehow, right? With some kind of mechanical device. By the time you get to the uh, Arabs in the uh, 12th century, you have a uh, very interesting fellow. His name is Ismail al-Jazari, not, not al-Jazeera, but al-Jazari. And he came up with several machines where um, he would uh, pump uh, water from a river. He could use that water later on for different things. Um, and you can see here the different mechanisms that he created. These are not just on paper. He, he actually created them and they were used in the Arab world. Uh, slowly they became known in the West as well. But he had these uh, different machines run by water, by rivers. They were able to pump water uh, from the river, send it through a channel, and use it for some purpose. Okay, they uh, sometimes had horses, sometimes they had slaves uh, do most of the grunt work, but, you know, these were machines that uh, started to look at pumping, okay, specifically pumping. And um, it's not until really the 16, uh, I'm sorry, the 17th century, that you get a guy, first guy who really does something with vacuum. And that's going to be this man, Gus, uh, Gasparo Berti, okay. Gasparo Verdi, he, uh, he, um, they, they were trying to solve a problem that was uh, given to Galileo, and this was one of his students. And the, the issue was that they couldn't pump uh, water from, for example, from the mines. They could not pump um, sufficient water. You know, they just got to a certain point and then it stopped. And they said, "Well, you know, what's the cause? How can we, how can we pump more?" And this guy didn't solve that problem, but he solved another problem. He says, look, you know, uh, I can show something. I can show that I can create a vacuum. Because, see, people didn't believe that there was a vacuum until that time. And this guy says, look, I can show you that there is a vacuum. And he created the first vacuum, artificial vacuum, uh, that we're aware of. And that is that he filled this tube, this high tube, with water. Um, he sealed it at the top, okay? And then he opened the bottom and let some of the water, he, he wanted to drain all the water, but the whole, all the water did not drain out. He realized that the water just went down to a certain level and it stood at, in this case, 10.3 meters high above, uh, above the ground. And that's where it stopped. And of course, uh, what he realized is that, you know, it, it had to do with the pressure of air and Galileo had a problem with that because he says, look, you know, uh, air doesn't weigh anything. And it's uh, this guy who's going to show really, uh, or at least the first person to realize that air might have some, some weight. And it's going to be uh, his buddy, a uh, guy we know a little more than he, we do him, and that's Evangelista Torricelli. Torricelli goes in there and he does the same experiment. He does it with mercury. And he shows that, yeah, indeed, uh, air has weight, okay? He's able to show that there's um, different pressures applied to different materials, water versus, in this case, mercury, okay? So, and that's why the, the tor, is, you know, uh, for vacuum um, level is uh, named, or pressure level, is named in, in honor of uh, Torricelli, okay? But it's, uh, it's around the 17th century, uh, mid, uh, about 1640s, that they start playing around with a vacuum, okay? And so they say, oh, look, you know, uh, we can create a vacuum right at the top of the, of the tube. And the way they did it is simply by 
doing this little experiment, they just said, look, let's fill it up with water or with mercury. Uh, we let it um, uh, drain into a pool of some kind. And whatever's left up there, that's vacuum. And not everybody accepted these, uh, these theories at the time, again, because of authority. Authority always stands in the way. They said, look, Aristotle told us. And uh, these people said, well, I don't know about Aristotle. I see something different here. <laughs> and they were able to, you know, to uh, produce a vacuum or what they thought was a vacuum. But, they, you know, there, there was a lot of debate. And this debate went on for a while until about mid-century, 1650s, okay, when Otto von Gehrig produces the first vacuum chamber, okay. He uh, took something close to what you would think of as a bicycle pump, but in reverse. Instead of pumping air into the um, wheel, it sucked air out. Okay, and he had this, uh, this, these two uh, half spheres made of copper. He was able to remove the air from within them. And then he had people trying to break it open. They could. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, he produced the first vacuum and uh, confirmed that air does have weight. Okay, so uh, uh, they're running experiments at this time and they're showing that there is such a thing as a vacuum. And so uh, now we have a little problem because we, we have, <laughs> it's like we haven't resolved the issue. Uh, is there a vacuum or is there not a vacuum? Like you take a chamber today, any chamber uh, where, where you produce vacuum, and you put a mechanical pump, and you can put it in series with a um, cryo pump or a diffusion pump, and the, cryo pump, uh, the uh, mechanical pump, the rotor uvane pump, will pump it down to the minus three tor level, okay? Tor from Torricelli, right? Uh, it's in tandem with a diffusion pump or a cryo pump, and those will pump it down to maybe seventh, eighth, even further, uh, depending on how, how long you, you're pumping, et cetera. There's, there's several um, factors that affect how much pressure, how much vacuum you can achieve. And... When you're pumping it down to the minus three level, minus four, minus five, minus six, you get to the minus seven, minus eight. I, I used to work with minus seven level. Question is, you're, you're sucking particles out of there. So now the ratio of particles to empty space <laughs> has gone down. You know, you have fewer particles in there. And then what do you have in its stead? I guess you have empty space. We call it vacuum. So we're confirming what Torricelli and and his buddy out there, you know, what they what they uh, uh, Berti, you know, what these guys showed, you know, 300, 400 years ago. Now the mathematicians are trying to tell you something different. They're trying to say, look, there is no such thing as a vacuum. They've they've gone back to ancient Greece. There's a, there's no such thing as a vacuum. Even the vacuum is made of particles. It's a uh, sizzling energy or vibrating or excited feels. There's all, all this junk out there, all this activity going on there in the background. So what, uh, what should we conclude? There's no such thing as nothing. And the issue here is that, you know, they're never going to answer this question. They're never going to answer the question because they claim that the answer to those questions is not in their field. It's not part of physics. They say that's philosophy or ontology or whatever. So they send you to the other side of campus. So even though we have, for those people who believe in experiments here, you have experiments. You have not only experiments that have been carried out since the 17th century, but today. You go in there, you pump a chamber down. You get it down to minus 7 Tor minus eight Tor level. What do you have in there? I, I mean, you don't have a perfect vacuum. I, I you know, I'll, I'll agree with there, uh, with you. But you have uh, removed particles. It's not like like in the case of Parmenides or Aristotle that says if you remove a particle, something else takes its place. Here, the volume of particles inside the chamber is reduced and nothing has taken its 
place because you can measure the vacuum and you say look uh, you know now you no longer have uh, room vacuum or room pressure you don't have um, minus three tor you don't have minus four now you have minus seven so there's been an, an increase in the amount of vacuum or the level of vacuum what does that mean what have what have you done you remove particles but there are still particles in there how come when we measure, we measure that the vacuum has increased or the pressure has decreased? Isn't particles, the vibration of particles, isn't that what causes pressure? Isn't that the definition that these people give you for pressure? You remove the particles, there's nothing vibrating anymore or there's fewer particles vibrating. The volume has decreased, the density has decreased. What has increased? Isn't it? empty space isn't nothing what's increased isn't the uh, isn't there few aren't there fewer particles inside the system and so this is the issue the issue is that we're running around in circles and what these people have done is gone back to the days of the Greeks they, they just don't call it particles they say well it's not particles it's um, energy it's fields and when you ask what is an energy? What is energy? What is a field? They say we don't know. That's not our that's not our problem. Look it up. <laughs> and that's the story. That's the story of vacuum. Um, so so we get back to Maxwell and we say, look, what is that's vibrating up there, uh, you know, in, in space? Is there an ether? Are there particles that are going up and down? What is vibrating? And the answer they give you today, uh, this is the, the advancement we made from the 19th century to, to today, is that, no, no, they're not particles. They're not classical particles in the sense of corpuscles. They're not little balls. What they are is energy or vibrating fields. That's, that's the answer you're going to get today. And when you ask what are those, they say, we don't know. And that's full circle in vacuum. Uh, history. <laughs> We're back to the Greeks. Okay, on Sunday, I'm going to be on JFG's program. I'm going to be talking about black holes and dark matter. So uh, I hope to see you there. Either rooting for me or throwing me down, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, just bring it on. See, see what you got. If, if you don't like uh, uh, me bashing black holes and people who uh, promote the ether or energy or mathematics or all that stuff that plays no part in physics whatsoever. So yeah, bring it on. If you got something to say about black holes, uh, bring it on. Uh, for sure, be prepared because if you ask a question that uh, is relayed to me regarding black holes, you better know what you're talking about. Otherwise, you might look like a fool. <laughs> So I'll see you then on Sunday, 1900 hours Eastern Standard Time, Quebec time. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.